Welcome to the Weekly Mac. Today we will be talking about impon, intom, incompetence. And all mistakes unavoidable. Today's guest, the neurobiologist Mara Dearson, will tell us a couple of things about how our brain works. We'll listen to the Catalan singer Marga Mbande, one of the best Catalan African voices, and no mistake. And we get people to confess some of their most silly mistakes. Check it out at our quiz, guess what? This is the beginning of the Weekly Mac, your favorite talk show in English, hosted by Marcella Topor. We often hear that brain is the most mysterious organ, but how does it work? In which way does the environment modify our brain? Stay with us because in the following interview we'll make some discoveries about how we think, how we dream or feel. Check out first a few of the words that will appear in the following interview. As today's guest is a renowned neurobiologist, let's begin the glossary with a very scientific term, in vivo. Studies that are in vivo are those which are tested on living organisms or cells, usually animals, including humans, and plants, as opposed to a tissue extract or dead organism. Pay attention to the expression to some extent because you'll hear it many times today. The extent of something refers to its length or size. You use expressions such as to some extent or to a certain extent as a synonym to to some degree. The third concept you need to know is impaired. When something is impaired, it has been reduced or weakened in strength or quality. It also means deficient or incompetent. And last but yet important, we find the verb to discard. If you discard something, you get rid of it because you no longer want it or because you think it's useless or undesirable. Each brain is unique and it makes us see reality in different ways. That is what the neurobiologist Mara Dearson says. She is group leader of the Cellular and Systems Neurobiology Lab in the Center for Genomic Regulation based in Barcelona and today we have the pleasure to have her with us. Well, Mara, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Well, first of all, uh, we'd like to know more about your job, what it involves, what, because it sounds a bit complicated, at least for me. <laughs> yes, it sounds complicated for everyone. Uh, in fact, what we are interested in is the neurobiological mechanisms underlying learning and memory. So we try to understand what are the changes at the cellular level, but also at the molecular level, that drive the fact that you are able to store information in your brain and to reuse it later on. So basically, we do this in animal models because of course for learning about learning you need to have a in vivo system but we also use cellular models so we also try to understand the cells by itself and uh, of course we use molecular biology. Mm -hmm. Okay so why is neuroscience so important nowadays and today and for the future of course? In fact if you think about the world how it is now it's mainly driven by how the human brain has uh, created the world, right? Mm -hmm. What we have invented, if you look around you, most of the things you will see have been invented by us. This means by our brains. And um, this is uh, now driving a whole revolution in how we see the world. So if you think about, I don't know, something as important as economic decisions, right? Economic decisions are taken by your brain. And if you can understand what drives economic decisions, you will see that the whole economic theory changes thanks to what we know about biology. And we have uh, now a whole discipline that is called neuroeconomy, that is trying to understand these kind of mechanisms. And I think that in the last years, the um, the discoveries, the new discoveries and the new techniques that allow us to really trace back to the brain regions what we are doing and what we are thinking and what we are feeling has allowed to really make a very big step forward in the understanding and the interpretation of the surrounding world and what we have created. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's a really fascinating. <laughs> So basically neuroscience uh, help us understand why and how we, um, we uh, take decisions every day. You know? So everything we do mm -hmm. every day involves neuroscience. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the way you think uh, and really uh, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Well, they say that each brain is unique. Yes. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there are a few features of functioning that are the same, mm -hmm. no, for mm -hmm. everybody. So, mm -hmm. uh, what would those be? <laughs> yeah. In fact. Um, what we have is like the macroscopic structure of the brain and the way it functions, let's say, in the basic function, for example, how it controls that your heart is beating or that you are, I don't know, breathing. This kind of automatic functions are very common. Of course, for everybody. For everybody, even though to some extent they are also under a certain voluntary control. For example, breathing, you can decide stop breathing, but not forever, no? Yes. <laughs> or breathe uh, slower or, or faster, faster whatever, exactly, yes, or control exactly. your breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there are other, let's say, higher functions that are more unique. So the way your emotions work, for example, <clears throat> is most, more common. So most of us feel fear in the same way or similar ways with a similar reaction in the rest of your physical, body. Um, exactly. Physical reactions, yeah. no? Yeah, well, no, the, the brain is also physical, I have to say. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Um, but, it, but there is a, such a, um, where is the, the line between physical and then uh, feelings and emotions and all that? It's, it's, everything is so, so tied up, no? Yeah, this is philosophical, but um, in fact, this, let's say, comes more from our understanding now of how the mind is connected to the brain function. So if you don't have a brain behind it, it will not work, but of course, the quality of the properties is different, right? So we are talking about a different level of functionality. Yes. If we are talking about cells or we are talking about the functional outcomes, what we call the mind, right? So in fact, going back to what makes us unique, it is these higher function related regions because those are more plastic, those are more dependent on the interaction with the environment. Yes. So what your experiences are providing is a way of connecting your brain during development mainly, but also during adulthood, that makes you unique. Okay. Uh, so in some, to some extent you are sharing uh, some properties of the brain with the others, but what makes you unique is how your brain is then connected and functioning. Okay. And you are the one that creates these connectivity maps mm -hmm. in your brain. Okay. So to some extent, you are a sculptor of your brain. And um, we go to the concept of uh, brain uh, plasticity, which is also a very interesting uh, concept. What does it mean and how can we um, uh, change um, our brains mm -hmm. in s some way we can but to what extent and how mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so plasticity refers to a property of the brain that is extremely important and this property is the capability of the brain to change the function and also even the structure and um, this will depend on the activity of the neurons. So okay. basically it will depend also on the environment and how you interact with this environment. And plasticity is related, for example, during development it creates these brain maps that we were discussing about before. In the adult it helps to learn and to retain information and then to reuse this information also. It also helps uh, to create what we call a brain reserve. So it uh, helps to be more resilient to, for example, neurodegeneration processes. And um, this is very much related to not just neurodegenerative disorders itself, but also to normal aging, non-pathological aging. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To what extent? This we, frankly speaking, we don't know because... We don't know yet. No, because there are several examples that tell us that probably we have much more plastic capabilities or potentials than what we think. Than we know. Yeah. I'd like to ask you if it is true what they say mm -hmm. that we only use a small part of our brains. <laughs> yeah, well, this is a 
urban legend. It's not, <laughs> it's not true. true. <laughs> uh, in fact, what, what no, a lot of people, I mean, most people uh, think, no, so, think yeah. that, oh, we've read that, they, they, we've been told that way, no? Yeah. I think it's a misinterpretation of something that we thought before, that is that probably our potential is higher than what we uh, usually expect or use, no? But uh, it doesn't refer to the activity of the brain because in fact, when you look at uh, the activity of the brain with the means that we now have, neuroimaging and so on, what you see is that you use all of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is, to what extent we can increase this potential, this cognitive potential or okay. other properties of the brain. This we, we, I think we still don't know where we can arrive. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, there is, um, um, you've been uh, talking a lot and gave many lectures about uh, our brain and how uh, we appreciate reality. And you've just shown me before a very interesting um, visual illusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, can we uh, give us, our viewers a brief um, explanation about that? Yeah. So you have to think about uh, the way we perceive reality in, in biological terms. So we only can perceive the information that we can understand through our senses, right? So this limits already the amount of information that we can process that we can incorporate in the system, right? We don't have receptors for uh, specific wavelengths, so we cannot perceive those. Yes. So this limits the number, the, the size of the information that we can perceive, but then, that we can sense, but then we also establish some limits to that. Yes. Because we are only attentive to some of the stimulus, right? to some specific pieces. So there are lots of things happening around us now and we are only conscious or focusing attention exactly. on what we are talking about. Well, before moving on, I'd like to ask you about your speciality, mm -hmm. which is uh, Drown syndrome. What did you decide this, uh, this uh, subject area and um, what have you discovered since you um, started to do research mm -hmm. on this matter? Mm -hmm. In fact, um, it comes from my interest about learning and memory about cognitive functions. So, to some extent, if you want to apply this knowledge in a way that is useful for society, it's obvious that you will look at those cases in which cognition is impaired, right? And uh, in my case, I decided to, to try to understand Down syndrome also for some specific like personal reasons. Uh, in my, my supervisor in my thesis is Dr. Jesus Flores yes. and he has two children now grown up but okay. at that moment children with Down syndrome yes. and uh, he was very interested about this problem and he got me fascinated about this problem also and this is why I started. Mm -hmm. Okay I think it's very interesting what you say <coughs> that um, uh, there is, uh, you like to talk about the term diversity yeah. rather than uh, mm -hmm. disability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, you know, when we uh, talk about disability, we are applying our standard uh, concept of what we think is normal. And in fact, normality is a statistical term. Yes, what is normality? Exactly. And, and in fact, it doesn't describe all the realities that we have. And what we know is that when you have diversity of points of view, then you get much more creative, much more innovative teams. You get a much better potential. So why should we discard people? I don't think we should. And I don't think as, uh, that as humans we have sufficient knowledge to uh, decide what's ca what can be discarded. Yes, and, and uh, labels, no? Yeah. Also quite... The stereotypes. Uh, yes. yes, stereotypes are quite These uh, are very dangerous harming. as yeah. well. Mm. Well, anyway, um, the topic <coughs> today, the topic of the pro, because we have a different, we talk about mm -hmm. a different issue uh, mm -hmm. every, every time, is incompetence. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you about making mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, do we know? why we make mistakes? Well, in fact, it's not my field of research, but making mistakes is the best learning strategy. Okay. Because it's when you learn more. So 
when you make a mistake, this means that you have now the opportunity to learn much more. Exactly. I mean, um, uh, making mistakes is, is, is human, no? but uh, what is good is to learn from your mistakes, exactly. I suppose. No? Yeah. Let's stop for a moment. It's time to welcome our collaborator, Tony Garcia, with famous brains that were misjudged. But before, let's have a look at a language tip. You know, we want you to be as competent as possible in English, so let's learn a few new words related with making mistakes. Don't be careless and pay attention to Helen Armstrong's lesson. Hi. So, how do we describe someone who's incompetent? So, usually we use the prefix miss. So, if we mishear someone, we don't hear them very well. If we mismanage a situation, we do a bad job of it. And if we misbehave, we don't behave well. Or someone could be just careless. So, they don't do a job properly and they're not paying attention to what they're doing. You could also be a butterfingers which is when you're incredibly clumsy and you always drop things on the floor. Now, if you do something in a hurry, maybe you're slapdash or you do it slapdash. So maybe you have to improvise quickly if everyone turns up at your house for a meal and you're not well prepared. But sometimes you're just lazy and everything you do, you do in a sloppy way. So you just don't do it very well. Now, something that could be worse than just being sloppy is to make a blunder, which is usually an action and when you make a mistake to do with that action. You could also botch a job, which is again when you do a job badly and you make lots of mistakes. And this could look very unprofessional. So, what do you think? Have I botched this tip? Bye. If you think bobsleigh is impressive, you don't know skeleton. We introduce you to the Olympic athlete Ander Mirambeñ in our portrait section. We have been talking about how our minds work with the neurobiologist Mara Dirson and now some of the brightest minds in history went through a hard time as kids because simply they were not understood by those in charge of their education. To give us a few examples, let's welcome one of our brightest collaborators and he is Tony Garcia. Thank you very much for lying. <laughs> Well, it's my opinion, okay, our opinion. Okay, thank you very much, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, I appreciate that. You feel that. flattered. Okay, yes, very much. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Okay, uh, Tony, so I think you brought us yeah, some interesting anecdotes. Of, of great people that, you know, had some problems in their childhoods. Um, the first one is Alan Turing, I think he's pretty famous. He's the guy who basically broke the codes, the Nazi codes in the World War II. Uh, without him, probably we'll, we, will be, um, we would be speaking German. Um, he was very good, very bright, but at school he had some troubles. Um, he was very bad at writing, and at nine, his teacher said that. Um, I can forgive his writing, even if it's the worst, uh, if it's the worst I ever seen, and I try to be eternally uh, his dirty work, but I cannot forgive the stupidity of his, of his attitude towards same discussion on the New Testament. So I think some th <laughs> something was going on and was 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 not only his writing or something, but his believings, and even, he, I think, he, when he was nine, uh, he was bright here and smart. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess he was um, discussing things with uh, the teacher, that, and the teacher wasn't happy. Well, but they say there are lots of people who are extremely intelligent and smart and geniuses, but who are also uh, quite distracted, absent-minded, and totally useful, uh, yes. useless, I mean, totally useless <laughs> in um, other fields of life. Yeah, well, this is what is uh, called the brain paradox. The brain so paradox. The brain yeah, paradox. in some cases, you have uh, extraordinary capabilities in some fields, in some competencies, whereas you have problems in others, right? Okay. And uh, this happens in, for example, in cases of the, what is called the savant syndrome. So those are extraordinary people in some areas yes. while they have problems in other mm. areas, right? Okay. Happens many cases in autistic people, in Asperger syndrome, for example, yes. you have As the well. same. And um, we, we still, don't understand very well how it goes, but 
if you look at many artists, for example, yes. were considered strange people or they were not kind of standard people, what we were saying before, no, what is normal? If we only take the normals, probably we will miss all these yeah. geniuses, right? Of course. Well, creativity, and creativity is tricky. Absolutely. We always say that. Yeah. Is this more common in people with really high abilities, geniuses, well, we could call them like that? Well, um, I mean, you know, this, of course, epidemiology in these uh, cases is difficult to do, and this is how we know if something is common or not. But it's true that um, some kind of, let's say, special pathologies or special uh, changes in the brain are most common in people that are, for example, artists or geniuses, right? Okay. Many of them you trace back in their history and you see that they had problems at school and uh, not just because they were maybe a little bit arrogant because they thought, well, this guy yeah. is telling me something that is not true or is wrong, but also because they had these, um, these paradoxical, let's say, yeah. abilities and disabilities. No? All of us have some abilities and some disabilities, let's say, mm. non-pathological ones, but exactly. I mean, probably motor coordination, for example, in my case, is not my best ability. So <laughs> in sports, I'm a disaster. <laughs> but uh, well, this is, of course, not harming my job yes. because I s selected something in which I was a little bit better, right? <laughs> okay. I think I have a good one. With a, g a good example what we just said um, <laughs> is Sir John Gurdon. Gurdon? Gurdon? I have difficult um, with that. Gurdon. How, how you would say it? Gurdon? Gurdon? I would say Gurdon. Gurdon, okay. So S Sir John well, Gurdon. We need to check it out afterwards. Yes, we should. <laughs> <laughs> he was the winner of the Nobel. done before, of, no? Yes. No, I, 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 I researched it. And I, you know that you have these, these videos in YouTube, like tutorials or something, but even uh, there was this woman saying the name, but uh, Gurdon, Gurdon, and okay, I couldn't, well, I couldn't catch it. So I'm gonna go we'll for Gurdon. We'll find Gurdon. out later. Okay. So he was the winner of the Nobel Prize in ph Physiology or Medicine in 2012, and he, when he was nine, he was asked to draw an orange. It seems like quite simple. Yes. Draw an orange. Anybody so can do that, no? His biographer says that he started drawing the stalk by which the orange would hang from a tree reasoning that an orange would not exist in space. The teacher tore up the piece of paper and reported to his parents that he was mentally subnormal and <laughs> would need special teaching. The teacher meant to say, draw a circle. So I think that's a really good example the, of the you know, simple things that if they tell you, just draw an orange, you would draw an orange, but a kind of... He you started know, with the stalk. Exactly, a kind of different mind would think about the space within the orange exists. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. it's fascinating. It is, indeed. absolutely. And in fact, if you look at how science is being done now, we try to cross fields exactly because of that. Yeah. Because how a mathematician sees biology is completely different exactly. from how a biologist sees biology. And this helps you also to open your mind and uh, look at the problems from different angles. And this is what, in the end, makes us really make step forwards, right? In our knowledge and in our understanding. Actually, it's important. quite amazing how uh, children's brains work. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think um, as adults, we've lost a lot of that yes. uh, imagination, creativity and genius. Touch. Yeah. Well, if you uh, listen to Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, you will see that he his opinion is that education kills creativity. And this goes back to what <laughs> yes. you have just explained, right? Probably our education system does not appreciate this difference and- Or encourage, Exactly, and because them. we have all this, I mean, I think that we should rethink how we are educating and what for we yes. are educating our kids. Are we educating them uh, so that they conform to what is the establishment or are we educating them to make a step forward and change the world so in fact what we are doing now is putting some yeah, information stimulation. there in their brains that they forget uh, afterwards because there's no meaning for them exactly and uh, i i think that this is not the best way of 
probably making uh, new contributions and uh, changing the world. I remember when I was a child, to be bored was good, you know? Boring was good because uh, it, it, it starts your imagination. You have to, yes. you have to it makes you fulfill think, these no? spaces. Exactly. And now it's the, it is the other way around. You cannot does, yeah. be bored for one <laughs> second because you got it's desperate. A, it's like, a huge oh, I'm problem. Bored. No, please, comes, give me yeah. something. <laughs> okay, let's continue with yes. the last, with the last uh, anecdote in this case. Uh, okay. Steve, uh, Steve, uh, Steven Spielberg, you mentioned before. Yes, Steven Spielberg is, you know, it's, I think it's the most famous director in the world. The most famous of all times, you know, there's Hitchcock, John Ford, there's a lot of them, Bill Wilder. But the one that I'll, at least my generation, not a lot of generations, mm -hmm. remember is, is, you know, Jaws, E.T., Jurassic Park, Shinless Lears, there's a lot. So he tried when, uh, when he was a, a young boy, he was um, to enter the University of Southern California for film, theater and TV, and he was rejected. Not one, but three times. And his teacher said, you don't have talent enough because he said that he was incapable you know of of uh, imagining space and camera and and timing he was not good enough in then, other words he was useless for cinema, <laughs> yes no? useless steven spielberg and then he he went and made 15 billion dollars with his movies i think it's good enough for for useless yeah, exactly. I mean, there are lots of cases, uh, you know, children with really bad marks at school and then uh, as adults they, they, they show immense or huge uh, mm -hmm. creativity and, and brain. No? Yes. But so. this goes again, no? Uh, back to what we were discussing before. Exactly. I mean, are we as humans able to really judge what is good, what is bad, who is talented, who is not? I mean, we are applying the same kind of measure for everyone, that doesn't make any sense. Mara Dirson is giving us some very interesting reflections today. Our brain keeps surprising us in an amazing way. And I would like to introduce our portrait section, which will surely impress you. The three-time Olympic athlete and their Mirambel races on a simple ice ring sled at more than 140 kilometers per hour while lying face down and head first. He started practicing skeleton when this sport didn't even exist in Spain and he has already participated in 11 World Cups. We've been with him in one of his trainings at the High Performance Center in San Cugat. Here's Ander Mirambel's portrait. My name is Ander Mirambel. I'm a skeleton pilot. In 2005, I was uh, doing uh, training and competing in track and field. And uh, one day I was uh, watching the movie Cool Runnings, uh, Elegidos para el Triunfo. It's a movie about uh, Bobsleigh, a Jamaican team who makes uh, the dream of the Olympic Games. And uh, suddenly I started to research on Google and check if there was a team in Spain and there was any chance to do it. We found out that there uh, was nothing at this time. Uh, we already talked with the Federation, with the Catalan Federation and the Spanish Federation if we can get some support to start a bobsleigh team. It was impossible then uh, with my friend Alberto we decided to start Skeleton because it was cheaper. And uh, that's how we started in 2005 in November. We paid everything by ourselves. We drove to Innsbruck Eagles and we started with the skeleton of school there and it was a little bit crazy because uh, we didn't have anything. We need to create our shoes, uh, uh, we need to buy everything and once we arrived there it was completely like, oh, where are you coming guys? We don't have race suits, you don't have uh, skeleton shoes, what are you doing here? So it was quite fun and it was a great experience. And at the end of this week of the skeleton of school, I fall in love with the sport and all the money I had, uh, I just invest in the sport, uh, trying to fight or trying to dream on the Olympic uh, dream. I did it uh, in 2010 after uh, four years, really hard years. It was not only me, it was uh, Bernat, it was my family, it was a lot of people who was pushing this dream. And not only one time, we did it three times. So I went to 2010 Vancouver, 2014 Sochi and 2018 in Pyeongchang uh, in Korea. That was the last Olympic Games and it's pretty impressive because I was dreaming in one Olympic Games and uh, you make it to three and it's wow, unbelievable. And not only this, uh, we had the chance to win the overall ranking of the America's Cup, a few races of America's Cup, and uh, be one of the best in, uh, in a skeleton when uh, 2005 I didn't know what's a skeleton. 
Here in, uh, in the High Performance Center in San Cuad, near Barcelona, we are training uh, the physical part of the sport. Uh, so you need to be fit to survive uh, six months around the world competing. We have more than 10 or 12 races every season. But the most important thing that we train here is the, the sprint, the start. The start of the skeleton, the push, is around 30% of the final result, depends on the track. So if you are not fast, forget it. You cannot have any chance to have a good result. So we need to be fast and then need to slide, have a good material. So here during the summertime and when we are training in the high performance center, we work on the specific area of the push. It's a sport that you need to drive into the limit and you need to find every hundred of second everywhere and you need to be ready to have a crash and you need to be ready to, to jump if you need to jump. So it's a really mental sport and I think one of the good things of this point of this season is my experience. And my experience is the mental area, how you can uh, handle every situation. Uh, when everything is going wrong you are able to find the best from this situation to improve. So the mental for me is one of the key points to, to make it for three Olympic Games and fight for the fourth one. My goal is to win the next Olympic, not just be there, try to compete and uh, improve the wrestle and fight for the top ten there. But uh, one of the things we do with the Spanish Ice Federation is I don't want to be alone there. So we are already we create a project, we have new athletes who live near Barcelona and around Spain who are testing the sport and uh, for next season we will have a skeleton team with women and men. And Looks like the sport is growing up. I think it's the only sport in the world that when you jump on the sled and you start, you cannot stop. You need to arrive to the finish line or to the hospital. So you need to, to finish. And I think the life is like this. Maybe you don't have the same problems in the normal life than in the skeleton. It's a little bit more dangerous. But in the mental area, in the way you need to decide, I think it's safe. Enjoy your life. That's why we are here. We only have one life. So whatever you do, just have fun. Welcome back, we have been discussing how our brain works with the doctor in neurobiology, Mara Dearson, and also Tony Garcia has come not to be examined by Mara, but to bring some examples of geniuses that were dismissed by their teachers as incompetent. Check it out on the internet, but a bit later, because Mark Broderick is already here with us for the mystery question. Isn't that right, Mark? That is indeed. Ready to go again for uh, some yes. more the inco best, incompetent the best Tony. Guy here. <laughs> okay, so can so, you tell Mara how it works? Mara, basically, the, you can grab any question you want from this uh, walls, open it up, read it, and answer it. And uh, Tony, uh, you as well. But I you have to well. answer it myself? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Both you and Mara. It's so I have to answer it, or yes. you will answer it? No, 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 no. You have to answer it. Oh, you have I to see. open it up, read it, and, uh -huh. uh, and answer it. Don't worry, Tony. Okay. This shouldn't be too difficult for you to read. <laughs> <laughs> to read. Exactly. Tony has... Been... To read, no, but to answer? To no, answer, no. maybe. Maybe. So, <laughs> Mara, would you like to read it out? So, my question is, what are you an absolute inept at? <laughs> Thank you guys for the Thank question. <laughs> so, probably at sports, I'm very bad. Uh, so motor coordination is not my best skill, frankly speaking. Uh, but I do my best to try to overcome it. Were you yeah. the last person picked when they were picking teams at school? Yes. <laughs> that must have been tough, must have been tough. T Tony well, probably was as well. Well, right. she's very good in other fields. Yes, so. she has other, she has other, quali other qualities. The brain right. paradox. Tony. What's your worst fear? Okay. <laughs> I think I'm afraid of highs. You know, I have vertigo. Vertigo, yes. Yes, so that's my... So no airplanes? Uh, no, I, jumping I, that's, that's my problem. I have to fly a lot, so I, I'm having really bad times lately. How do you get through it? How do you overcome Pills. your fear? Pills. Okay, <laughs> <Yes>. good. <laughs> okay, yeah? yeah? Satisfied? That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. satisfied, absolutely. Okay, and before uh, we go, I would like to, to ask Mara about um, uh, an important project for you, which is in this case the third international conference of the Trisomy 21 Research Society. 
uh, to be held in June in, in Barcelona. So um, what will it be about and what's your role in it, Mara? So in fact, uh, I'm the president of the 2021 Research Society and uh, this is mm, a world uh, an international meeting with world experts that will come. So we will have the most important people in the Down syndrome research field with us. But what I think is uh, unique about this Congress is that there is a session, a whole day yes. program for family associations. Why? Because we think that uh, the science discoveries are also very important for them and they should know firsthand what has been presented in the meeting. So this is the, I think, the only meeting, at least from our field, that is bringing the results, the latest results to the public, to the families, as they are presented in the Congress. Okay, and it's held at uh, Cosmo Caixa. At huh? Cosmo Caixa, and it's in June, the first day, is so from the 5th to the 9th of June. So we are in fact uh, having a whole program to make people aware of what is done in Down syndrome research along the year. So we have a round year program uh, that will start next month. And uh, we hope that this will help also uh, raise awareness about Down syndrome, raise awareness about what Down syndrome can bring, not just uh, about knowledge about the, the disorder itself, but also it can help us understand many other things. For example, there are, I mean, we know that Down syndrome people have less prevalence of solid tumors than the rest of the population. Excuse me, in what kind of tumors? Solid tumors, oh. so breast cancer, for example. They almost have no cases of breast cancer, right? This means that there are some protective factors in Down syndrome. If we study Down syndrome, this will also benefit the rest of the society. Of course. So it's not just because of them, it's just because of all of us. Well, Mara, time's up. Uh, I think this well, was a fascinating that's talk. Such a I, shame. I'm sure you agree I need with to me when I say Very that. Very interesting, yeah. yeah. I was, Extremely interesting. Yeah, I like we learned <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we learned a lot today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Tony. Thank, Thank you, you for very your much. examples. Until Thank next you. time. And Mark, I'll see you soon. See no, you I'll bit. see you in a bit, not yeah. with Matthew. Absolutely. Okay. Pack your bags for travel, but don't put too many clothes in it because we're going to near the equator. In our e-speaker section, we'll visit Ghana. It's time for our Guess What special quiz show and let's welcome our two favorite contestants, Patricia Scalona, Mario Serra and of course our special guest master, Sergio Cervera. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back, by the okay. way. Okay, thank you. Well, if last week we tested Patricia and Marius about love, today we are going to test their knowledge about incompetence. Oh. How do you feel about that topic? Very competent. Very competent. <laughs> exactly. I feel incompetent. You will have to be very, exactly, indeed, competent <laughs> at it. So, how good are you making mistakes? Ooh, I'm, you I'm will a genius. See. <laughs> you will see in a minute. <laughs> All right. They so, will offer you a live demonstration. <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, we like to change our quiz every now and then. So, to warm up today, we will start with the challenge of pairs. We're looking for jinx, that is, fictional characters or people who bring bad luck to others or to themselves. I will give you a clue, a book, a series, a person, and you have to ring your bells and say which jinx character or person is associated with it. So okay, let's go for it. The Road Runner. I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> ah! Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I, can, I can keep doing this for the whole Forever, show. Forever, you can keep doing Three, it. two, one. Coyote. Ah. Yes. Coyote. He Coyote, right. He said but the best Marius. Coyote. Good. <laughs> one point for <laughs> Marius. <laughs> that was well good. All right. Two, Some guess. mothers do have them. Say that again. Some mothers do have them. Well, that, that's supposed to be them. a title of anything? 
That's a tricky question. We're going to count down. <gasps> oh, and okay, let's three, give them some clues, two. maybe. Okay, go for mm, it. It was a TV series. Mm -hmm. Oh, three, British. Two. British. They used to do it on TV3. TV3. One. <laughs> Time's no. up. No idea. France answer. Oh. Okay. Point goes to <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Must be. <laughs> Next one. Tweety. Oh, 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 oh Marius. Uh, 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 Sylvester. There you yes. go. Oh, Sylvester. Correct. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Two points. All right. All right. Cat. Maybe you are going to be happy with the five point question later. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about all that. Right. The Pink Panther. Three. Two, uh, one, Patricia. Correct. There you go. Two, Patricia. Oh, yeah. Patricia. Titanic. <laughs> the iceberg? The, uh, oh, oh, oh. I'm, I'm really tempted to count that. <laughs> it's exactly. Might uh, be a character. A character, one of the characters. Might be a character. Jack? Correct. Okay. Correct. <laughs> Correct. One point to Patricia. The iceberg was much better. If I would be a fair quiz master, I would give you well, an extra point for that, but I'm totally in okay. Yes, this okay. was a tricky answer, uh -huh. and maybe we should warn them uh -huh. that we've got a few Next one. Maybe one we and might have one or two in the same on the, along the same exactly. lines, some tricky ones. Okay, but then you have to allow for imagination. If they're tricky questions, you I'm, have to agree with our answers. I'm going to be happy we know about it. They're imaginative. Ready I think. and Tin Tin. Tin Tin. Miles. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would say that uh, Dr. Haddock. Uh, that's Mr. not correct. No? Point goes to Patricia if she is right with the answer. Okay. Hernandez, San this Fernandez. This is. N oh, oh, yeah. oh the pawn and the pawn. Correct. Yes. That's true. That's it. Okay. That's it. Exactly. That's it. That's it. Hernandez, San Fernandez. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Which in English would be? Mm -hmm. The pawn. The pawn and the pawn. The pawn and the pawn. That's ah. not an. That, that, that's not for, for points. <laughs> exactly. That's just, exactly. That's no, just for you. Because that's translated. Nah. And that's then... Thompson and Thompson. Yeah. But it's going to be fair if she gets an extra point as well. There she said the iceberg, <laughs> and I was tempted to give that. No, uh, but as not a because right of the answer. iceberg, because the answer should have been in English. Because the quiz master says so. And Let's continue. Spanish, no. said it in French. That's she... Murder She Wrote. <gasps> murder She Wrote. Um, Murder, um, she wrote. Oh, na, yeah, na, na, yeah. Na, na. Marius. Uh, well, that, that was uh, Dr. Fletcher. Correct. <laughs> uh, Correct. Jessica Fletcher. Jessica Fletcher. Point to Marius. That's it. Good. But, okay. but you say that it has to be in English. Okay, that's okay, but that was in original. Marius, version. I'm going to take this point out. <laughs> nope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove oh, this quiz point. Master, don't be I'm bad. a strong quiz master. Don't, be, Star don't Wars. jinx me. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars. Patricia. Darth Vader. Oh. Darth Vader. I wasn't Shouldn't listening. be correct, but actually we were having a debate at that point, so that's an extra point, but still so. If you want to answer, I'm giving you the chance to answer. For another, another uh, jinx character. Actually, actually, exactly. Actually, uh, all of them are quite jinx. Quite jinx. Uh, <laughs> would be Luke Skywalker, according to us, but Darth Vader was uh, really, really, Fresh really, really up, unlucky. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so okay. point to Patricia. That will do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Today I'm just being uh, totally crazy about yeah, the point. Yeah, okay. Luis or very Moya. generous. And, or very generous. <laughs> Luis Moya. Correct. Luis Moya, you say? Yes. yes. That, that's Luis Carlos Sainz. Correct. <laughs> Point to Marius. Trata five. de arrancarlo. That, that's in English? That's in English. Oh, so nice. summarizing, five points to Marius, four points to Patricia. Okay. Okay, so which ones of, or which one of all these characters do you think are the most jinx? The most of all these? Yes. <laughs> Difficult to decide, You can right? explain why Darth Vader is one of them, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the dark oh, side. The dark yeah, side. Yeah. Or Jack from Titanic. After all he does... Jack from Titanic. Oh, no, the I, I'm sorry, the iceberg from Titanic. <laughs> the iceberg. <laughs> or Titanic was the jinxed the one, actually. <laughs> exactly, you know, Titanic, like... yeah. Okay, so we check the score, which is 5-4. Uh, five five, four. Four, and uh, it's time now to move on to the second round, and also the last round, and today, we need to tell you that we have changed our multiple uh, multiple uh, choice tests. Okay. I mean, it will be a bit different than last week. Oh. Every yes. day is a surprise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have asked people in the streets about the biggest blunders they have made or have witnessed it. So please pay close attention to the uh, to the following story and the videos that we are gonna we're gonna broadcast. A friend wanted me to draw a tattoo on her. 
So she got ink, like a whole bowl of ink, like permanent ink and uh, a needle. And uh, she was very nervous, so I was stabbing the, the, the tattoo. This is 15 years old. And then she got, ah! Oh! And... So we are talking about this girl tattooing her friend. And what went wrong, all right? So option A, she misspelled the initials of her friend, love, in the tattoo. <laughs> B, she dropped the needle and stained her wooden floor. Or C, or C, she poisoned her friend because the ink was low quality and she had to take her to the accident, the accident and emergency room. <laughs> well. A, B, or C? Well, I think that the funniest is A. A, A is the funniest, and Patricia, Just do you feel Just to say something funny? different, B. E. So, B for Patricia, A for Marius, let's see what's gonna happen. Okay. She dropped the old ink on my wooden floor. <laughs> it was a very hard moment, and um, we spent a couple of days with White Spirit to get it out, because it was just black ink everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, what? it was the initial of her boyfriend, of course, around, with a heart around, and I was like, I'm not doing this. But she's like, oh, I'm gonna pay you. Um, yes, <laughs> she, I was like, oh, money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a bad moment for her, but a good moment for Patricia. Thank you. Yeah. Point a bad for moment for me. <laughs> exactly, bad moment for you. So we are even right now. Five to Patricia, five to Marius. Mm -hmm. So second story, that of a resourceful man. I wanted to cut a board and I knew I could do it with hot stuff. Like I, I used to go put the knife in the fire and then cut it with the knife. So I thought maybe if I took metal cables and put them in the electricity, one in negative, one in positive, and put them together, they will make fire, I don't know, they will be hot. And I did it. Well. I'm sure the TV series <laughs> MacGyver could be sued for damages here. But how did this particular invention go wrong? Did it go wrong? <laughs> apparently, apparently. Let's see how it ends. So, num I mean, option A, the board caught fire and he had to call the fire brigade. B, there was a blast. And C, he got electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yes. he's still alive. Yeah, he's, well, he's no, telling the story. Let's see, let's see. He's telling the story. Oh, I'm gonna answer B. B, well, okay. Uh, uh, then I'll answer, I'll answer A. All right, so the board caught fire and he had to call the fire brigade for Marius and there was a blast for Patricia. So let's see how the story ended. And it was a big explosion, and but everyone was okay. So that was, I think, maybe the best. All right, one point to Patricia. She was right, exactly. There was a plus. Six for you, Okay. five for you. Oh, that's nice. You still have the five points, don't worry. Yeah. You'll catch me there. <laughs> that's anytime, my reserve. Anytime you guys try to improvise something and it went wrong? Um, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> In my day life, I'm not very able with my hands. I mean, uh, if you're I have to... You're not very good with your hands. No, no, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were you good at writing? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I, I think hands. before writing it. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go on to the um, uh, last question. Mm -hmm. And as usual, this question is worth five points. That's yours. And someone here no, no, is very right? excited about so, it. Um, here you come. No, with yeah, so point. pay attention because it can change everything. Exactly, <laughs> nothing is decided yet. <laughs> and now for the last story of mistakes. How good are you as parents? Well, I hope you're better than the protagonist of the following stories. They were really excited about being uh, a parent, uh, someone I used to know, and they were always, always yamming about how happy they were to have a child and then the first or second time they took the baby to the park. Okay. <laughs> what did this parent do? A. This parent got distracted and left without the baby. B. This parent took another baby instead of theirs. <laughs> or C. This parent dropped the baby in front of passersby. <laughs> I am not a mother, so you, you're gonna get this one. 
<laughs> well, uh, I can't imagine uh, a normal question. Neither can I. A normal answer, but I would say B. B uh, for my use. Took, uh, the, this uh, parent another took <laughs> another baby instead of theirs. <laughs> Wouldn't be that nice. No. And Patricia, what's your guess? That, that, would be, that would be my guess too, but I would say A. Just yeah, a. You know. All right, so okay. let's see let's what's see. the right answer. They left them there because they got distracted chasing after another person that they knew. So we have a winner today and we have someone who's really happy to have five extra <laughs> points. She won 11 points of Marius, who's having five nice points. That's my pleasure. I still don't <laughs> agree with the five point rule. I think that's, that's not fair at all. Okay, so um, similar mistakes. What's the most understandable mistake that you think a parent could, uh, could make? Ah. No, not very serious, but, you know, confusing the names of the children, like with my mom. <laughs> well, like yeah, my mom goes not... through all of us before he reach, she reaches, you know, whichever name, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's if you have uh, many uh, children. <laughs> if you only have one, <laughs> one and, you <laughs> and you get a mistake, <laughs> that's really uh, great. Mm -hmm. uh, would be great for you. I okay. could agree well, with that. Well, that's true. Okay, so, so much for Guess What? And now it's time, as usual, for our Guess Word. That is the weekly puzzle by Marius Serra, in which we have to guess a word. So, Marius, can you tell us the clue for last week? Yeah, last week it was uh, a sort of magic clue, and it was say an incantation letter by letter. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, quite easy. Very. Because it was... <laughs> Five letters, like five points. Yeah. So, so Patricia, <laughs> you have to know it. I know. I knew it last week. Neither uh, me or my riddle assistant could okay, no? so crack who, the enigma. Okay. So who can give the solution? Are Spell. you sure? Spell. Spell. Yes. That's it. You well are done. spelling names constantly when. Uh, uh, when you find or meet someone, but a spell as well is an incantation. Amazing. So, okay, and what about good. next week? Well, next week uh, won't be so magic. That's it. <laughs> Four <laughs> letters only. Be careful with your brain. Four letters. Be careful with your brain. Four letters. Okay. Be careful with your brain four letters. Remember the solution next week. That is, unless you solve it on your own before that. And if you do, please post it on our social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Well, thank you, Marius and Patricia, for playing with us one more okay. week. And thank you, Sergi, for showing us that no one's perfect. My pleasure, always. You, yourself included, Absolutely, suppose, absolutely. No? <laughs> no one is perfect. No. Okay, we'll be back in three minutes. We'll visit Ghana and then meet the singer Marga Mbande. Today in our e-speaker section we are going to Ghana, a country in West Africa about the same size as the UK with a very rich and diverse landscape. And if you want to know more about it, please pay attention to what Yusuf Abdullahi has to tell us about his homeland. Hello, my name is Yusuf Abdullahi and I'm from Ghana and I've been living here for eight years. Ghana is one of the best countries in West Africa and which have the best rainforest. Then we, there is a lot a different kind of trees. You know, we know about the Odum tree, the Nim tree and also uh, what we call, we have a tree called Wawa. Ghana is the like a multicultural uh, country and we have different kind of people and different kind of culture, you know, but people are unique in the country. You know, we are all together as one. I recommend you to visit the 
Accra, the capital city, is the one of the largest city in Ghana and with a lot of tourist attraction. The Labadi Beach is, the, I think, is the one of the best beach in uh, Accra. And also, you can visit to the Cape Coast, where you can visit to the Kakum National Park, where you will see like 300 mamas, over 300 mamas, and uh, 300 species of butterflies. You know, and you can have this uh, canopy walk in the Kakum National Park. Well, I guess it's the Dr. Kwame Nkrumah who led the Ghanaian independence in 1957. My favorite dish, I think, is fufu. I think it's one of the best food I like in Ghana. In, in the, when you come to the Ashanti region, it's the, one of the popular food in the Ashanti region in Kumasi, where I am from. Fufu is it come with in different uh, kind of uh, varieties. It can be made of cassava. It can be made of plantain. It can be made also with the cocoa yam. You know, but I like the cassava one the most. Well, when you come to the Accra, we have the Homowo Festival, which is mostly sub celebrated by the Akan people in Accra. We call it Homowo Festival. And when you come to the, the Ashanti region, we have the Ashanti Kingdom, which is the most powerful kingdom in Ghana, the chief tenses kingdom in Ghana. Her voice has left a deep impression on the local black music scene. The Catalan singer-songwriter of Equatorial Guinean descent Margam Bande breaks with all the styles, sings in English, Spanish and Catalan and in the language of the Combe people. Well, Marga, thank you so much for coming to the Weekly Mag. First of all, tell me more about Combe language and people. Combe language. Well, we can put Kombe. Kombe is inside a group that is called Endue. Okay. And that's the language that my mother told me. Yes. I speak Spanish from the, because I was born in here. But, but it's my, my first tongue, but my second one is Kombe. So. Okay. Well, you define yourself as an African born out of Africa. That's interesting. Mm, yeah. Tell me more about it. Well, it, it's it's simple. It's what it is. My father's, my parents came from Equatorial Guinea, like more than 40 years ago, and the way that I was raised was Africa. So when I come out from my house, then Spain starts for me. You know, so at home I can speak Spanish. I can speak Combe, and. And your music, it's quite amazing because you can deal with so many styles. I mean, ranging from soul and funk to hip hop, mm. uh, R&B and so on. But um, if you had to define your style, how mm. would you define it? That's a hard thing to do, <laughs> but, but well, yeah, you can try. Yeah. yeah, now I'm more interested into the Afrobeat movement, no? coming from Nigeria, Ghana and stuff. I'm, I'm trying to follow that that flavor, no? Okay. To put it on my music. But I started on hip hop, listening to rap and R&B. I was in a girl group. We were trying to be like Destiny Child and stuff. And then after, I started to work with Monica Green, yes. doing backing vocals for her, like during three years. Before that, I was working with Princesito, which she's the king of Afrobeat here in Barcelona doing reggae, raga, backing vocals for, for him. Okay. So, I've been playing with so many different musicians, listen, listening all kind of music that at the end, I think that it's natural that I have all of these styles in one. But you've always been involved uh, with music? Yeah. 
Um, you have started uh, to sing when? As a child maybe or you had uh, musical training, you studied music or you, uh, the music started later? How did it go? Yeah. Um, at the beginning I wanted to dance. Like I was four years old and I imagined myself dancing but it, that, it didn't happen. At the end, and I started to sing like 10 years old, like till now. Just on and your own. My training has been always stage. Like, of course, I have. I've been training my my vocals, and I'm doing it still. But I didn't go to any school. My school has been working, doing the okay. mistake, correcting it. And the stage, That's my, no? Yeah. Actually, they say that stage mm -hmm. is your strong point. Yeah. That your live performances are really spectacular. <laughs> That's true. Well, I don't know if it's spectacular or not, but one thing that I know is that anything that I, that I do is to get to that point, to get to the stage. Any other thing, being here talking to you, which is amazing, I do it in order to get into the stage and to connect to people. Mm -hmm. I don't and when you're on stage, what happens? What's your secret to be so full of energy and, and so full of this charisma? Or is it just natural? I think it's a natural thing. It's a natural thing and, and it's a thing that I've been learning during the, the mistakes. Mm -hmm. No? Okay, it's, it's like good. It's, For me, it's more than 20 years uh, doing music on stage. Mm -hmm. And now, after these 20 years, is when I'm enjoying it the most. And to me, if I'm in on stage, people have to remember something from me. I need to connect with people. That's what I do. Your latest project is Mbanda. Mbanda, Mbanda Sound. Sound. Yeah. Okay, the name of the band and also your latest uh, work. Mm -hmm. What is it like? Well, uh, I did this in collaboration with Arturo Perez, with okay. its, which um, is the producer of the, of the project. And it was nice, it was nice. I love, one thing of me is that I love the digital thing. And I also love the organic, so sometimes I feel like dropping up an, album, an EP like this, no? like, like with the digital sound. It was good. Mm -hmm. And the style of it? The style is kind of pop, you can call it pop. Okay, in general terms. Yeah. What about the lyrics? I know you write your own lyrics and yeah. sometimes they can be very socially committed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think music is a, is a very powerful tool. So, sometimes I... I, I because I know the, the, what you can do with some certain lyrics and certain words, I try to put it on my lyrics and, and put it out and make people think about it. But I also love to do some songs to dance to make people forget about the problems. That's good. Yeah. Well, but um, I, was, I mentioned socially committed issues before mm. and um, you are also involved uh, with some activists See. like uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Mm -hmm. Musu Sembemma? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which it's a means quite difficult word to woman. pronounce. An organization mm -hmm. that fights uh, ablation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so how did you get involved with this project? Well, uh, um, wow. This is, <laughs> this is a thing that I, I wanted to get more involved in. Now this thing is kind of stuck. But I'm, I'm going to try to start it again. It's a couple. The woman has these things done okay. to her. Mm -hmm. and, and the man is trying to help her, you know, from the beginning. So they have this situation and they are helping other girls here with this problem. But it's, it's, it's hard because you need people to, to help you in order to do It's a really big thing. Of course, and um, because you were born, you were born here. But yes. you said that your parents migrated from uh, Guinea. Guinea. Yes, yes, of course. So, um, how do you see? What would you say about the way migration is dealt here in this country and we have in a Europe? Problem. We have a problem, and and we we have to face it. I think we Europe don't want to face the 
the problem that we have. Here in Spain, you can go to Ceuta and Melilla and see what is happening. People is dying there, no help. Like, but there are some organizations that are doing things like open arms, which I would love to, to get involved with them, to do something. They do some kind of action, like, we have a problem here that we have to face and solve. Apart from these uh, social projects you are involved in or would like to, to collaborate with, what other musical projects um, are you involved in? Oof. <laughs> so many. I have a problem with that too because I, I don't, sometimes I don't know how to say no. Like, but for example, I, I play with this band, Almafrobit Ensemble. We were touring Middle West and Chicago this summer and probably we are going back again. So I get involved in, in any project that I, that I think that I can put something of me. And if they call me, you know, if there's a good feeling. Because at the end of the day, I've never had like a plan, like a plan done. I, I move with the energy. I move with the energy with the people that calls me, you know. And today, what are you going to perform for us? Oh, yes. T today, we are going to perform alongside Shola, Albert Casanova, and Jordi Sanz and Choveta. We are going to perform a song of mine, but I've been, I've been playing this song with a lot of different musicians. And now, after five years of playing this song, okay. I think that I, I got the point. It, and it's called Hurt No One. Okay, Hurt No One. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Marga, for coming to the Thank program. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me. And while Marga gets ready on stage, it is time for more language tips. When talking about incompetence and why it happens, there are a lot of idioms to choose in English. Find them out with our teacher Tim Wari from International House Barcelona. Hi again. So, what are you useless at? Now, I have to confess that I am useless at singing. I can't sing a song to save my life. That expression means that even if my life depended on it, I wouldn't be able to sing. But I can play the piano, so you can't say I'm all fingers and thumbs. To be all fingers and thumbs means that you're very clumsy, you're not good with your hands, maybe you're not good at manual tasks, especially if you're nervous. Now, mistakes tend to happen when we're not prepared. Maybe you're in a situation where you get caught off guard. For example, in a job interview, maybe if they ask you a question and you haven't prepared the answer properly, you could say, oh, that question really caught me off guard, caught me unprepared. Um, maybe, also, you could be thrown in at the deep end. This means, well, we imagine it. Imagine you go to the swimming pool, it's the first time you've been swimming, someone just throws you in at the deepest end of the pool, how are you going to feel? You're going to feel unprepared for the situation. You're going to be scared. This can also happen in professional situations. Maybe if you start a new job with lots of different responsibilities and you're completely unprepared for it, they threw you in at the deep end. Also, another one is to bring a knife to a gunfight. Again, imagine that situation. Everyone else has got a gun. You've only got a knife. You're not prepared for the situation at all. Um, and if we do something when we're unprepared, the results are probably going to leave a lot to be desired. This means they're really not good enough. We can use this one when we're talking about, for example, going out for dinner. If the food's really bad, we can say, that food left a lot to be desired. Sometimes, in some situations, we can just say that that person is not up to it. They're not good enough for the situation, okay? To not be up to it. Um, a very important one when we're talking about being prepared is Forewarned is forearmed. This means if you've got some warning in the past, if you know what's going to happen, then you'll be ready for the situation. So those are the expressions for today. Give them a try. Thanks a lot. There is a Roman Tarragona and another Tarragona. Today we discover La Parvasha with the Danish journalist Hal Kenner.
need if time to make up your mind Soon you realize That I'm the one that you need The one that you need for life, for life Baby, all you need is time to make up your mind Soon you realize That I'm the one that you need The one that you need Diana King style Make up me my be of you, make up me mind Can keep you even though me did I try how it happened, people don't ask me why. Now me happy to the truth. Now me can't tell no lie. Oh la, me can't be my me happy, me can me mine. Can keep you even though me did not try. How it happened, people don't ask me why. Now me happy to the truth. Now me can't tell no lie. And I love you. I'm not crazy. I need you. Does it worth it? I love you. I'm not crazy. back to the weekly mag. We're going to visit Tarragona with a Danish journalist who has been living in Tarragona for 14 years. Her name is Hella Kettner and she's going to show us around the city in our next home from home section. Enjoy. I'm Hella Kettner. I'm a journalist from Denmark and this is Tarragona, La Parbaixa or Barri del Port. I've been living in Tarragona for 14 years. Um, basically, I came to learn Spanish and then I ended up learning Catalan as well and, and falling in love with Tarragona, basically. I mean, it was small enough to have, like, to get around easily and to know a lot of people. And at the same time, it was big enough to have a little bit of everything. When I was asked to choose one place in Tarragona, it was kind of hard because I love everything about Tarragona. And if I had to say something like it, that is very special about Tarragona, it's not, it's not a certain place or it's not a certain building. It's, it's the whole air it, it, it has and the light. I mean, it's, it's the light, and especially in, in winter and in, and in autumn. The light of Tarragona in the, in the afternoon is just like amazing. Of course, the Mediterranean Sea has a, has a big part in what Tarragona is and what it was and what it used to be. Like Tarragona Romana, no? like with the Romans, where it's located because of the, because of the sea. So of course it has like a, an impact on what Tarragona is and what it was. I like this neighborhood. It's 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 humble, and it's, um, it's it's all kind of people living here. That's what I like about it. And it's like a forgotten part of Tarragona, maybe, but it's also a very important part of Tarragona. And it had an important meaning to Tarragona, um, history-wise. I mean, for me, it's important to show this place because Tarragona is much more than the Roman ruins, and I really like the Roman ruins of Tarragona. But I think it's, it's important to stress that Tarragona is a lot more um, than, than the, the Tarragona Romana. So what I love about this place as well is that you have the tinglados here, which are like full of art. So they've done like this art center here, the Tarragona Art Center. It's based down here in, in La Parvaixa. And, and you have these amazing, amazing um, exhibitions. So yeah, this, this area is really nice. I mean, it's, it's a good excuse to get out of, of your house.
The last English lesson of today is related to adjectives. Do you know the difference between gradable and non-gradable adjectives? Do you know how to make them weaker or stronger and which adverb goes with them? Well, if you don't, you'd better pay attention to Tim Guinness' lesson, which is coming next. Hi. Today we're talking about adjectives, and I'm sure you already know what they are. They're describing words. But did you know there's two main types of adjectives? We have gradable and absolute. So what are they? Well, I'll explain it to you. Gradable adjectives are the ones you probably already know. So think of things like hot and cold, or we've got big and small, or good and bad. So we can make them stronger by using words like very, really, so, or rather, and we use them in comparatives as well when we're comparing two things. So this car is bigger than that car, or we use them in superlative as well. For example, Gerard, he's the funniest person that I know. And we can use them with two, so oof, it's too hot today, can't do anything else. Now, in comparison to these gradable adjectives, we have absolute ones, and we can't use these in comparisons or in superlative. And they're actually the extreme of the meaning. And I'll give you an example. We have cold. Well, the absolute adjective is freezing. Or maybe you've got hot. Then you've got boiling. Or maybe you feel tired. Well, if you feel extremely tired, you're exhausted. Now, and because they're the extreme in the meaning, we can't always use them with the same quantifier. So you can't be slightly freezing. No, you're either a bit cold or you're freezing. But we can make them stronger or sound more dramatic. And we do that by using completely, absolutely, or very. So I'm not just a little bit hungry, I'm completely starving. It's not a bit cold, it's absolutely freezing. But don't be absolutely terrified of these gradable and absolute adjectives because I have a very good tip for you. You can always use the word really to make both of them stronger. So I hope you learnt a lot in this amazing, absolutely fantastic lesson. And until next time, I'll see you. end our show without dedicating our here and there section to the incompetence of Catalans, English and Irish. And let's say hello to our collaborators as usual, Mark Roderick and Matthew Tree. Hello. hello. Hey. So, incompetence is the topic today. So would you say there are different kinds of incompetence? I'd say that we're not incompetent. I would start with that, with that <laughs> sentence, okay, just to put that yeah. out on the table. I would second okay. that. I know yeah. you would second that. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There are definitely different uh, fa facets of incompetence. Anything from uh, service industry, restaurants, things like this, to uh, low-cost airlines, to musical incompetence. Like, there's lots of ridiculous numbnuts that are getting famous for being musicians when, in fact, they have no talent. And uh, incompetence in uh, people who have become famous for taking pictures on Instagram. I would call this a, a level of incompetence as well in some way. Or maybe not. I don't know. What do you think, Matthew? I think it's always got to be work-related in some way. Like, okay. that can be music, that can be writing, but it can also be uh, working in a bar or a restaurant mm -hmm. or a company or whatever. You know, any kind of work. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't talk about an incompetent lover, for example. <laughs> I would say... You haven't made love to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, okay. that's an experience. We yeah. Should we move on? Can exactly. we just move yeah. on from that? It yeah, yeah. I was too fast for that, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, We're, we've only begun, so wait a little easy, bit easy. until okay, we okay, warm yeah. up, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's well, anyway, go there. Uh, let's yeah. talk about different countries and um, incompetence from your own experience. Different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I always had this theory, right? I, I don't like, really like to talk about incompetence of the specific country. I would like to talk about the positive things of each country and which things I would pick from a country to make the perfect country, okay? okay. So, uh, without a doubt, uh, in terms of competency in restaurants and service injury sector, I would pick the Canadians, okay? Like really? my experience in Canada with bars <laughs> and stuff. Uh, the country works well, uh, you know, the, the services are good. I would, I would take that part. I would take the friendliness of the Irish, 
Okay, I would take their friendliness, possibly their music as well, you know, their good, good, good music and stuff. And then I would throw in like the Catalan food, the Catalan weather, and uh, maybe a Canadian slash Catalan way of running the country. That for me would be the perfect okay, country, the country, without incompetence. The country you, so you would, can take from that you what would you like want. to live in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's okay. my little mix mash. What do you think? That's nice. No, I'll, I'll stick with incompetence. Now, I, <laughs> I, I did notice I, I used to have a job working, teaching English, in fact, in a, in a large company in Catalonia. In fact, the second largest exporter in, in Catalonia at the time. Um, it then went bust. And what I noticed was that uh, the men in the company often were people, they didn't speak foreign languages, they didn't have much of an idea of how the business was working. I'm talking about certain specific people, normally on the executive level, mm -hmm. and they would always get promoted and promoted and promoted, whereas the secretaries, who were all women, who knew often two or three different foreign languages, knew perfectly well how the business worked, always stayed at the level of being secretaries. They were never promoted to executive level. And because they were women, you know, it, 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 well, because they were, they were women. So it was that kind of sexism, uh, which I understood from talking, or have understood from talking to lots of people, is still quite a problem in Catalonia, that you get this situation where men are promoted simply because they're men, but not because they're particularly competent uh, to do the jobs that they're being promoted to. Yeah. Whereas in England, for me, the big problem is not so much sexism, because that's been kind of well, let's say it's something that's criticized very heavily. The problem is classism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to give just one example in, in politics, 75% of all British prime ministers have been to a private boarding school. 29% of MPs in the parliament in Westminster went to an expensive private school. And you might think 29%, that's not that much, but yeah. then it's 7% of all schools in Britain are private schools, so in fact that's quite a, uh, a high percentage. So they're, they're, picking, they're picking the creme de la creme from like four schools basically, or whatever, yeah, well, well, I'm exaggerating. No, mm -hmm. you're not at all, because one out of every ten people in the Westminster Parliament right now went yes. to the same private school, which is Eton, the most mm. elite private school. And the rest of them went to Hogwarts. In <laughs> 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 well, okay. they'd probably be more competent if they'd gone exactly. there. Exactly. You know? But what it means is you've got they all these people. They would do some magic. Sort of be, yes, that's sort of lacking in, in the <laughs> Westminster Parliament at the moment, uh -huh. badly. But it means that a lot of people are being injected into very powerful positions simply because they went to the right school, in mm, inverted commas. So, you know, that's why you get people like Boris Johnson, who was an, was an obviously incompetent foreign minister. I mean, he made mistake after mistake after mistake, but he'd been to Eton, you know. Ah, there you go. So, that was the one, Eton, yeah. exactly. Anyway, uh, yes. Mark, uh, where did you go this week? And oh, what did you ask people about the incompetence? The pinnacle of Catalan incompetence. And now I'm going to teach you a word. It's called gaslighting. Okay, I'm gaslighting the Catalans here. Gaslighting. Gaslighting. It okay. means that that's an interesting it, it's term. A, it's a joke. Okay, uh, I, we went to the pinnacle of Catalan incompetence, which is the Sagrada Familia. My the God, Sagrada Familia. When are they ever going to finish that bloody cathedral? Mm -hmm. It's a joke. But this is okay. where we went, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit uh, tough to say that uh, about a Sagrada Familia, but uh, anyway. I, 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 have, coming from I have no you, problems doing it, coming okay? Coming from you, I will okay. respect, I, I still respect it, okay? But it's just, uh, as I said, I'm gaslighting. It's a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gaslighting, which is a synonym of... Um, kind of like wind like, you up, okay? Exactly. Winding the Catalans up, basically. It's what I do on a weekly basis, more or less. <laughs> 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 okay, let's discover what they said. Today we're going to talk about incompetence, and no better place to talk about incompetence than the Sagrada Familia. 130 years they've been trying to build this thing and they still haven't finished. If that's not incompetence, I don't know what is. Look, there's thousands of people who are adoring this incompetence. Let's go, they must be experts at it. Why haven't they finished building the Sagrada Familia yet? Are they incompetent? Too hard to finish? This architecture is so huge. This seems very complex. That takes time. Maybe they just didn't collect enough money. Do you think that there's another country that would have finished this already? Probably France. <laughs> 
So the French are more competent than the Spanish? Maybe. <laughs> Would it have been finished if it was Americans building it? Not yet. Why not? Because we have labors and strikes and everything takes 18 times as long as it should. If this was being built in Brazil, would it be finished already? Oh, definitely not. It probably would be half. If this was in Poland, would it be finished already? It's sure. Why? Because uh, uh, we, we work harder, maybe, than Spanish people. Uh, which country do you think would finish this, this, this construction fastest? Germany. <laughs> Why? Because they're hardworking people. Uh, I think something like Finland in the north, really north, because, but Italy, it is good, so <laughs> stop to say that. We can do it. Italians can do anything, okay. Absolutely. Feckin' useless. Need some decent service in this place. Man, you want to get something done, you got to do it yourself around here. Look at that bird shit. I, I wasn't brave enough to actually clean somebody's car that was somebody in the car, so I just cleaned a really dirty car that was outside the Sagrada Familia. <laughs> you were good at it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a, I have a, a, sec a second uh, job, possibly cleaning cars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it was uh, quite interesting, no? And lots of uh, different people. Lots of different um, nationalities. As you know, every day there, there must be like pff, anything from 50 to 60 different nationalities milling around the Sagrada Familia. And I, I thought the question was quite interesting. I mean, like, which country would already have it finished, you know? I mean, you know, the Catalans, I, I understand why. I mean, I'm, I'm joking here, obviously, but they, they said the Finnish, the typical ones, no, the Finnish, the Germans, etc. And of course, the Brazilians said uh, they wouldn't even be halfway done. What about the so, Irish? Uh, the Irish, uh, we're good builders. We built New York City. You know, uh, that's uh, we built uh, Boston, so I mean, uh, we'd probably be finished at this stage, yeah. <laughs> In between beer and beer, we would have had finished. <laughs> Although the stonework is complicated. I was waiting for the beer to appear yeah, in this conversation. Always, always wait for the beer, <laughs> always wait for the beer. <laughs> All right, a more incompetence. Well, building, building related, I mean, I could give an, yeah, a, an, a, a, a specific example of when I was working as a, an industrial cleaner on a building site in London. You were working as, as an, an industrial <laughs> cleaner as, on a you building site in London. You must have a CV that, that reads like a thesis note. No, like, it's, it's I did this and I did this. <laughs> yeah, I did, there was a time when I did lots of different jobs. You're full of surprises, and man. Like, and like on this building site, they had a problem with the water pipes. The water pipes were leaking. So they hired this guy, I mean, an expensive guy, you know, a plumber. Well, a, a, a plumber, you know. <laughs> And he came in, and in order to stop the leak of the water, he put in pieces of cardboard. You know, you mean ca he just stuffed the, the yeah, pipes Yeah, and with cardboard some... is not water resistant, you know. I mean, I as thought, we all know. As we all know, you know. So he did that, and of course the pipes went on leaking, and then they got rid of him and, uh, and got a real plumber. You know, that would be one example. But I have a Catalan example of incompetence as well, which really? was specific, which was a long time ago on Easter week. I went to a small town on the coast, village on the Costa Daurada called Amelia de Mar, mm -hmm. Easter week. And it was full of holiday goers, mainly people from here. And they hadn't hired, all the cafes and bars had not hired one single extra person to attend to them. So I was with someone uh, there. We waited 45 minutes for an aperitif, which we didn't have time to drink. We went to a restaurant where they took well over an hour to serve the first course, which was a salad. And people <laughs> at the other tables, there was one table that didn't have any cutlery. And they were just shouting to the waiters, could you bring us some cutlery before Christmas, if possible? <laughs> you know, and it was just, well, two examples of... Uh, English and Catalan incompetence. If you compare this, that I was I was talking to a friend recently uh, in Toronto, and he was he was a sous waiter. Now imagine this, a right? Oh, a, a sous, sous waiter. A, so he told a, me, a he's like, listen, American in waiter. the restaurant, you have the person that that at the door that greets you. Then you have the sous waiter who sits you down and gets your drink order. Then you have the waiter who sells you the wine and the food. And then you have the busboy who brings the food and cleans the table. That's five people dealing with one table. It's incredible. So I could, if they just hired just one of those extra, <laughs> maybe you would have, you would have had more, more, more luck. That's yeah, it. the service mm -hmm. here is, is, not, is not great. I cannot say that it's n not great everywhere because I have, have had some, actually some of the best service I've had is in here in Catalonia. Mm. In a, in a restaurant in uh, out in near Manresa, I believe, and it can, but it's very hit and miss. It's not, you know, if you go to America or Canada, 95 or 96 percent of the time the service is excellent, almost too annoying, 
to that, you know, having five mm. people dealing with you, but it's, they're more competent in this case. But, but that's normal in Canada, or it's just the really expensive restaurants? No, I, think it's, I think it's blanket. I think that most restaurants do have somebody that greets you, somebody that picks up their things. So they actually, they're well staffed. Mm. Richer country, wow. maybe as well. All right, so almost everywhere in Canada, what about here? What's your impression? Uh, here, here it can depend. It can really, sometimes people have a stick up their arse, excuse my expression, but uh, the, the, it almost feels like you're being, you're owed something for sitting at their table, you know? But I've had good service here as well. And in fact, in the next video, uh, we talk about that. We talk about like the yeah. service industry in general mm -hmm. in, uh, in okay. other countries. Well, I guess it there. depends where you go as well. Uh, no? It does depend, it depends on the, where you go and who you deal with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the following video and find out. Is there any skill that you don't have or that you're useless at that you would like oh, to improve? No, I'm perfect. Is it difficult to be perfect? Yes. Too many people around me and they are so jealous. Too difficult. <laughs> Anything mechanical. Why? Because I'm terrible. I can't even open a box. Speaking Spanish? I think like him, Spanish. What would you use Spanish for? Seduce girls, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Definitely. To seduce some girls, yeah, also. Yeah. I want to be an artist. Where's the worst service? Like when you go into a restaurant or a bar, which country is the worst service? Spain, people are a bit rude. I'm here in Spain, yeah. in Barcelona, yeah. It's terrible. It's terrible, yeah. I don't even have 4G and the Wi-Fi sucks. Italy? I don't belong there type of vibe. Italy is a, there are a little bit issue, but... That's what other people have said. Yeah, okay, okay, come on. But um, I think that is a little bit a cliche too, because come on, Italy is not like a pasta, pizza, mandolino. We are not only this one, I swear you. Belgian. It was Greece. Ukraine. India or, or this area. Back home in Addis Ababa. I'm from Ethiopia. So uh, sometimes the service was not that good. Maybe the UK. Why? I, they just seem to take forever to do anything. So they're slow and useless. Slow, anyway. <laughs> you're not. You're, st you're standing on the fence here. Quite a lot of criticism in this video. No? Yeah, but it was quite varied. It wasn't it, uh, directed directly at uh, at people here in Catalonia, as you saw. Even even they they gave out about the UK, the service being slow and useless as well. No, you saw that. Well, one of the big differences. It was a, a an, Engl uh, an English a, a half Scottish, half Irish friend of mine. Who, who noticed this when he came here, and I'd sort of got used to the idea, but he said it's like, here people take responsibility for their jobs, whereas in Britain, not, not so much. It's a kind of different mentality. And also in, with service and all that kind of thing, it's like here, waiters, barmen, it's a professional job. You train to do it, yeah. and you get paid, you get social security. It's, it's like a, a profession like any other. Whereas normally, at my experience, at least in London, of of, I've never worked in a pub, but I, I've known lots of people you who have worked in pubs. You haven't added that to your pubs. thesis of a CV? No, 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 <laughs> I never worked in a pub, but I, I knew a lot of people working in pubs. They were just, they weren't professional bar people. They were just sort of people looking for a job. Yeah, yeah, sure, take that job. I like you know. something that they do here is they wear waistcoats. You ever walk in and you have these men wearing these waistcoats and these lovely like shirts? You don't get that in Ireland or Canada. Also, in fact, speaking about incompetence, the civil servants the, in in every country. I'm sorry. Let's let's yeah. not let's not you know hit hit on Catalonia everywhere. The, every everything every bureaucratic process that involves doing anything, especially in Ireland. Ireland is awful. Ireland really? they will do it. They're very very slow. Everything is done on paper, but they will do it with a smile. You know, they like <laughs> it feels like you're having a conversation with them, but you're getting nowhere. You know, okay. so it, it, they do incompetence, but with a smile. And that helps. Uh, it helps swallow it, but it do, it only lasts so long. And the Canadians generally it's done uh, online or you have to queue for a long time. And here I will pass it to Matthew because I don't want to feel like I'm attacking gas gas lighting the Catalans or Spanish mm. too much. Okay. What do you think? What's your experience with civil service here? Uh, you find <clears throat> the same thing you find all over the world, but just occasionally you just find someone who's really nice and says, hey, no problem, and fixes it all for you very quickly. That's happened to me three or four times with mm -hmm. doing quite difficult stuff. So what about, um, what about traveling? You, oh, you have traveled um, Quite a lot, Mark. So Quite your lot, experiences yes. with uh, maybe um, 
airplane companies. Oh, uh, I can tell you, I've been on two or three airline companies that I would never go back on. I remember I was on one from Thailand back to Egypt uh, uh, on a re really horrible service. Uh, the, the airplane w looked like it was from the 1940s. Uh, the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole experience left a bitter taste in my mouth. We arrived late, but here in Europe, as we know, we, we are the, the kings of the low-cost airlines, no? And especially from my country, we have one of the, the most famous or infamous in many cases okay. of uh, the low-cost airlines. And my experience is I'm too tall for low-cost airlines. So therefore, every time I take a low-cost airline, I'm like this. <laughs> So straight away, uh, the, I, would, I don't know, do I relate that to incompetence on the engineers <laughs> or you know, lack of empathy for tall people? Poor Mark. <laughs> and let's talk about personal taste. Is what, what, for example, uh, winds you up when it comes to incompetence? What kind of uh, incompetence you could say that you just cannot stand? Well, as we were talking about this uh, low-cost Irish airline whose name we won't mention, the last okay. time I flew with, uh, with it, which was to Stansted Airport in England, uh, the delay was nine and a half hours. And I was stuck in Girona Airport, which is not the most exciting <laughs> airport in Catalonia. There's not very much to do there for nine and a half hours. But if there is one thing that really gets my goat, it's... <laughs> Um, as we can't say names, the train company which has a total monopoly in the whole of Spain, okay? I have traveled for years with this company because there is no other. They always thank you for using the company, but you don't have any choice. <laughs> and, like, I have, I have had 20-minute trips that have lasted for two and a half hours with no explanation, no information. I have had to change trains in the middle of nowhere like hopping over the tracks, which for me at the time was no problem, but there were customers there with, or travelers with, with on crutches who had to sort of hobble into, the, into the, the waiting train. But what irritates me the most about this particular railway company with its monopoly in the whole of Spain <laughs> is that it spends millions upon millions of euros on high-speed rail and high-speed stations, of, which often nobody uses, and spends hardly anything at all on stations that are used by thousands of people, specifically in Catalonia, uh, every, every day. And to give just one example of incompetence, total incompetence, they had a high-speed rail line, a railway line, which they built from, uh, through linking Cuenca, Toledo, and Albacete. And they had to close it down, they had to close it down because so few people were using it, about 11 customers a day, that it would have been cheaper to hire a private limousine for each customer. I was thinking, how incompetent can you get? You know, that's like, you know, that's like the that's ceiling. That's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be, you know, funny if it wasn't tragic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If it wasn't our money. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and that as well, yeah. of course. Okay, let's move on to the third video, yep. third and last video, which is about uh, um, incompetence, but from which angle? From which angle? Well, I talked about whether they believed that they were better than their bosses at certain jobs or not. Mm. You know, like whether they believed, like as you had spoken before about these really highly efficient uh, secretaries in jobs that probably could have done the boss's job. So we directed the, mm. the line of questioning in this okay. particular video was Tricky that. Tricky question. Yes. Can't wait to see what they said. <laughs> Let's have a look. Do you think that you would do a better job than your boss at work? Well, it's a bit hard because I am the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a but good boss? I, I can always improve my skills. No, I'm a terrible boss. <laughs> so I can definitely work uh, better than him. I could definitely do a better job than him. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. You gotta be careful, right? <laughs> is he your boss? No. No? What, what, what relationship is, is he uh, to you? He's my uh, future husband. Oh! I will be the boss. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes on hold here to get some bloody service. What would you consider to be an incompetent lover? <laughs> Ooh. Do you know Patrick in uh, SpongeBob? Yes. Yeah, that's a really, really bad experience. <laughs> the starfish. The starfish, yeah. <laughs> I can't say. <laughs> if there's too much emotion from one person and not enough emotion from the other person. Do you consider yourself a skilled lover? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <Can you? laughs> it's not like German, Italian, it's the person in itself, so 
What would you consider to be incompetent? German people. I, don't know. <laughs> I think the man must love me and uh, love me with all her, uh, uh, all his heart. And uh, uh, no matter she, what what he looks like, um, um, even if he looks like Danny, Danny's quite. I think he's He's cute. Oh, oh, so yes. he could be a, he could be a competent lover. Yes, I think so. But I don't know whether or not he loves me, right? <laughs> well, we can find out afterwards. Don't worry, Danny. We'll we'll stop it there and find out. <laughs> yes, maybe you can. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. You are handsome. Okay. So bye, bye, bye. Bye, 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 Danny. See you later. See you later. <laughs> Well, Mark, I can see you don't waste your time too much <laughs> no. while you're away doing this uh, video. No, I don't. And I, th I think it, it definitely came across that Danny did go away with that Chinese girl and she did discover he was and an, in cute. an incompetent lover, I believe, was her line. Really? No, I'm joking. It's good. <laughs> yeah, Danny. I hope so, because he's Danny. in the room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right, let's continue uh, with incompetence. Uh, you asked them about uh, bosses and here we have a book written by Matthew Tree, by mm. the way, called, with a very interesting name, La Puta Feina. Mm. In English, that would be? Fucking work. <laughs> it's about that a strong, very it's interesting, about that level. A very interesting name. So, why did you write this book? What made you uh, write it? And um, share stories about incompetent bosses and so on. I was just surprised nobody had written about that subject before, because it was at a time when I was starting to get stories at the same time from different friends about really terrible things that were happening in their workplaces, you know, from sexual harassment to total incompetence of the boss and so on and so forth. So I thought, well, it would be uh, a nice idea to, to do a book. So I wrote off to a lots of different people and got a whole load of experiences, bad experiences at work back. And that was the, and I included my own. Okay. And, uh, and that so, was the... Um, so what was started. the worst experiences, or experience you had with an incompetent boss? Oh, there were, there were so many, but I do remember, and please don't laugh at this, another job I had... I'm just laughing at the picture on the inside. I think it's brilliant. I haven't seen you that young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the book came out a while ago, Mark. You know, it's... Sorry, sorry. Thank okay. you for that. So, don't sorry for yeah. interrupting you. Sorry. You should see Let's my first book. You know, I look really young in that. Uh, I was working at the time as a messenger boy for a... a, a <laughs> Uh, for a company that, uh, like, my job really was just wheeling a trolley round and delivering uh, I'm mail to the different rooms. I'm fascinated with the variety rooms. of jobs you had in your life. Yeah, Matt. but this was, it was a very simple job. I turned up on time, but all of us, there were two of us, two messenger guys, and the boss was just a man who could not stop shouting at the two of us and anyone else who was sort of under his aegis, so to speak, uh, which was two or three other people. And so, because he shouted at us for everything all the time, in the end, you just switched off, you know. So he'd be there, don't you ever do that again? And I don't know what, and we just were sitting there, yeah, yeah, okay. And that was just one example, but I've had all kinds of bad mm -hmm. bosses, yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's no been a um, fun show today. It has been a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> I am just, I'm really enjoying this picture of Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can, you can take it home. I don't know if you might give it a read, agrees. actually, yeah. No? Yes, yes, you go. Yep. Of course you can take Thank it you. home. And Thank then you'll you give it to me because I want to read it as okay, well. Okay, no problem. Okay, yeah. well, I'll see you next time. See you next time. Mike. See you next time. So much for our Here and There section and the weekly mag as well. We say goodbye until next week, but you can check out our interviews, quizzes, music, language tips, and so on on the internet. Follow us on at the weekly mag TV. And don't forget the guess word puzzle by Mario Serra. Be careful with uh, your brain for letters. Be careful with your brain for letters. Can you solve it? Well, have a nice week and remember to keep your English up and running. Mm -hmm.